Last week, I answered the charge commonly given by King James Version defenders that those of us who use modern translations of the Bible in English are on a slippery slope to liberalism. I don't deny that there is such a thing as a leftward slope, nor that there are people on it. I simply noted that the Lord can restrain his own from sliding, as he kept Abimelech from touching Sarah. I noted that you are probably not a prophet, you don't know another disciple's future. And more to the point, I argued that the use of contemporary English Bible translations is neither logically nor empirically connected to doctrinal drift. This week, I turn to offense. I urge my King James only brothers, consider yourselves, lest you also be tempted. Some people are so busy moving away from the leftward slope that they don't realize how far they've backed down the rightward one. They never stop to consider that there is a slope on the right and not just on the left. They seem unaware that people can slide in more than one direction. Did you ever notice that mountains have many slopes? And yet I rarely hear anyone in my circles, and this is a reflection of my right-leaning circles, I admit. I don't hear my tribe talking about the rightward slope. It's as if gravity only works on the left side of the mountain, or as if there's no friction on that side, but there are plenty of plateaus, or at least handholds, on the rightward slope. But I'm convinced that the God who told us to look neither to the right nor to the left must show us real mercy if we are to avoid falling down that rightward slope. Here I stand at the pinnacle of the mountain of doctrinal fidelity, perfectly balanced and therefore perfectly stable. I speak as a fool, I cast myself and all my doctrinal views on the mercy of Christ. Everybody to my left is, by definition, on a slope, but so is everybody to my right. And yet, again, I have to admit, as I did about the leftward slope, that a whole lot of people on the rightward slope seem to be reasonably stable where they are. It seems their master has made them stand. Just as there are evangelical Christians to my left who do believe the Bible, who do believe the gospel, but who are, I believe, wrong to accept female pastors, I believe there are true Christians to my right who do believe the Bible, who do believe the gospel, but who are, I believe, wrong to insist on the exclusive use of the King James Version. Do I think egalitarianism and King James onlyism are equally wrong, equally dangerous? God only knows. I simply wish to describe the slippery slope to my right as I see it. I'm actually going to describe two parallel tracks that are headed down the slippery slope on the right side of Truth Mountain. One of these I borrow from one of my favorite teachers, the legendary, brilliant, and hilariously quirky master student of the Old Testament, Dr. Bob Bell. I owe my penchant for constant checking of multiple translations, in large part to him. We did it so many times in Hebrew exegesis. The other track on the rightward slippery slope I will save for the end of the video. I have sobering words to deliver. First, Bob Bell's slippery slope insight. Dr. Bell did me the great honor of coming to hear my address on Henry Ambrose at my alma mater, Bob Jones University, not all that long ago. You can view that here on YouTube. And he opened the Q&A with a profound insight that I had not thought of. He connected dots for me in a helpful way. See if this helps you or warns you. Dr. Bell pointed out that there is a logic to King James onlyism, and he saw not only where that logic has come from, but where that logic naturally goes, where it slides. This is not to say it will go there, it will slide, it certainly has not gone all the way empirically for anyone I know. God is able to restrain us all from reaching the logical end of the slippery slopes that we all step onto as fallen and finite human beings. But follow Dr. Bell's logic. Here's the first step Dr. Bell delineated. King James only is say all the time, what good is a perfect Bible without a perfect copy of it? They're talking about Hebrew and Greek. Now here's just one example from King James defender Chuck Surrett in his book, Which Greek Text? If God's word has been preserved for man today, then careful exegesis of passages with an emphasis on the precise meaning of words is a rewarding activity. If not, then such precision is unnecessary. Did you catch what Dr. Surrett was saying? His argument is that if we don't have a perfect copy of the Greek New Testament and perfect confidence in it, there's really not much of a point in careful grammatical study of the Greek New Testament, careful Greek exegesis, because maybe the text we're studying was poorly copied and we should just give up. We don't even know we have the right words. This is textual absolutism, as I call it. It acts as if anything less than complete certainty is equivalent to complete doubt. And this is where the most responsible version of King James onlyism stops. 
they insist to me all the time that they do not take the next step down the slope and go on to Ruckmanism. They tell me that the text is the issue, not necessarily the translation. And I applaud them for their restraint and clarity. They acknowledge the possibility that another translation of the right Hebrew and Greek texts could be made into English. Chuck Surratt is actually willing to say that the New King James, for example, is in some places superior to the King James because the text really is the issue for him, and I believe him. But know that such brothers don't actually produce Bible statements that teach this first step, perfect Hebrew and Greek texts. Psalm 12, 6 and 7, you know, the words of the Lord are pure words, thou shalt keep them, O Lord, thou shalt preserve them. Those verses simply do not promise such a thing. They are not talking about the Bible at all. And if Matthew 5.18, you know, not a jot or a tittle will pass from the law, if that verse is talking about perfect textual preservation, it and the Bible more generally give us zero guidance on how to find the perfect Hebrew and Greek texts. So I don't think, and I've argued this at some length in other videos, I don't think that this passage is promising perfect preservation at all. But I have a measure of genuine respect for my brothers who take this position, this the text is the issue position, because I think their initial read of Matthew 5.18 is plausible, and because I see them making a sincere attempt to avoid further errors that we both agree are errors. They're trying not to slip down the rightward slippery slope. However, in my experience, the less responsible pastors and nearly all the lay people in the churches who formally confess that the text is the issue also take the next logical step down the slippery slope as delineated by Dr. Bell. That is, what good is a perfect copy of the Bible without a perfect translation of it? It is indeed the Ruckmanites who are best known for taking this step, the followers of Peter Ruckman. But as I've just said, I hear evidence all the time that the average King James only pastor has also taken this step without fully understanding it. It is a very logical next step, almost an inevitable one in my experience. In my previous video on slippery slopes, I showed a clip from a sermon by Pastor Terry Angel, I assume that's how you pronounce his name, who was preaching from the pulpit of North Valley Baptist Church, home of Golden State Baptist College. Here's another clip from that message. Some of you guys are going to get out there and it's not going to go, maybe, maybe you don't have a school and you have a town of 6,000 or a town of 2,000 and you've got a little more time on your hands and you're going to start listening to junk. Oh, yeah. Now I tell you, well, I'm a TR man. A TR, not Teddy Roosevelt, folks. That's not Teddy, what he's talking about here, okay? I'm a TR man. I'm a Texas Receptus man. We, we believe the Word of God was inspired in the original manuscripts, Hebrew, a Masoretic Hebrew, and the t Greek Texas Receptus. I'm a TR man. I, I appreciate the TR, but I'm not a TR man. I am a King James Bible man. I can't read Greek. I checked with two graduates of this school who are about as connected as they could possibly be to it. And they both told me that they were not taught this in the school and that this had never been the position of the school previously. One of them told me, and this is someone with deep personal knowledge of what he says, that Pastor Jack Treber simply did not understand the error of what he was affirming by so loudly amening the statement. Terry Angel took a clear and self-conscious step down the rightward logical slippery slope into Ruckmanism. Jack Treber, leader of the institution, publicly followed him right away. And yet, praise God, this is the step down the slope where a lot of King James-only Christians stop. I think they have stopped in a place of doctrinal error but not one that threatens or undermines their Christian faith itself. This is not a gospel issue. Countless Christians who have self-consciously or half-consciously or unconsciously stepped into Ruckmanism, belief in a perfect Bible translation, namely the King James, countless of these Christians will step into glory with me and our disagreements will fall away. They will discover that I was right, of course, and they will play ultimate Frisbee with me. And they'll play on my team and my throws will be perfect in heaven every time, but the defense will be perfect too. You know, I'm not sure how sports actually work in heaven. Anyway, we'll all be there, a bunch of Ruckmanites and me. Not many wise, not many noble are called. But the Ruckmanites do have some odd company in this veil of tears, and this can't be denied. It's mainly the Roman Catholics, as far as I know, who have been known historically in the European West anyway for believing in a perfect Bible translation. It just wasn't the King James Bible, it was the Latin Vulgate. The canons and decrees of the Council of Trent said 
that the, quote, old and vulgate edition, they mean common edition of the Latin Bible, has, by the long usage of so many ages, been approved in the church. So, they say, in public lectures, disputations, preachings, and expositions, the old vulgate should be held as authoritative, and no one is to dare or presume to reject it under any pretext soever. Those same canons and decrees later say that other translations of the books of the Old Testament may be allowed only to learned and pious men at the discretion of the bishop, provided they use such versions as elucidations of the vulgate to understand the sacred scripture, but not as the sound text. This is precisely what one of my oldest King James Only friends told me after he read my book, Authorized. Maybe he would read other versions now after having read my book, he said, but only as if they were commentaries, not actual Bibles. But how does this make sense unless the King James is presumed to be perfect? The Ethiopian Bible in the ancient language of Giz was and is also believed to be perfect by lots of people, mostly Ethiopian people, of course. The Greek Septuagint, the ancient pre-Christian translation of the Old Testament into Greek, has also been considered to be perfect by various Christian groups, mostly Greek speakers, of course. In other words, it is a common and actually understandable temptation to treat the Bible in your hands as perfect. But once again, at this step down the rightward slippery slope, we have a position with no Bible warrant. There is no Bible passage anywhere that says or implies that we will all get perfect Bible translations or that any of us will in any language group. My King James only brothers tell me, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. So we have to have every word, they say. But is this really what Jesus intends to say in this verse? I've covered this elsewhere, but the fact is that Jesus is quoting Deuteronomy and he doesn't actually quote the relevant verse with word-for-word -word accuracy and perfection. He changes Lord to God. For one thing, take a look for yourself, even within the King James. I just can't get from this verse, Matthew 4, 4, to perfect Bible translation without a number of leaps that the Bible does not demand or endorse. Sure, there are translations of the Old Testament and the New Testament that are therefore, in a sense, you know, inspired, inspired translations, but the King James translators themselves point out that these quotations don't match the Old Testament perfectly. And it's quite a jump to say that because some translations in the New Testament of sun lines from the Old Testament are inspired, that means that one particular 17th century Bible translation into English is also inspired. I mean, really? Why the King James and not the Latin Vulgate? Why the Latin Vulgate and not the Ge'iz Bible? Why the Ge'iz Bible and not the Septuagint? I've never heard any King James defenders reflect in any detail upon the implications of their view for Bibles in other languages. The closest I've seen is actually my best opponent, Christopher Yetzer, who has recently gained even more respect from me by making some detailed charts comparing ancient versions to the King James. He did a ton of work. I give him major props. Am I allowed to give props? Am I cool enough? I don't know. I hope to talk about his work in an upcoming video. But at the end of his work, I just wanted to ask him, so why take the King James as perfect and not one of these other translations that differ slightly from it? When people step onto a slippery doctrinal slope, it's uncharitable to predict that they will keep sliding. It's wise to pray that they don't, but also wise to warn them, as I am doing now. Perfect translation is the next logical step after perfect text. Even if not everyone takes it, there is definitely a gravity pulling in that direction. Empirically speaking, however, a large number of professing Christian people don't realize that they are dangling their feet over the very Ruckmanite double inspiration they say they reject. See my long 10 ways to avoid Ruckmanism video if you don't believe me. I think I demonstrated this conclusively. And yet some go further down the rightward slope. They ask the next logical question that Dr. Bell suggested to me. What good is a perfect translation of the Bible without a perfect interpretation of it? Now we get into a view that is even more recognizably Roman Catholic, though not yet fully there. And I feel the pressure of Catholic arguments against Protestants in this area. They ask, if the Bible is as clear as you say, how come even all you Protestants don't agree on what it means? Christian Smith, a former evangelical sociologist, is now a Catholic sociologist because of what he called pervasive interpretive pluralism. I'd be lying if I didn't admit that sometimes I wish that God would give me some urim and thummim to help me discover the right interpretation of a given Bible passage. 
of some of the ambiguities that I think he's inspired in scripture. Minor things, but ambiguous nonetheless. Who wouldn't like to know with divinely given certainty what baptism for the dead means in 1 Corinthians, or whether and where there are gaps in Genesis genealogies, or even just who wrote Hebrews? I'd settle for knowing just that one thing, and I'd be foolish if I did not admit that my traditions as a Reformation Protestant play a strong role in my Bible interpretation. I think they should, actually. I think it's impossible to read the Bible without some kind of tradition informing you. So what you should do is not pretend that you don't have a tradition, that you just read the Bible straight without any influence whatsoever. Instead, you should self-consciously keep your tradition in mind and hold it up continually to the light of Scripture. Reform it. I catch hints from Protestants, however, that they have dangled a foot out over this step on the slippery slope. I hear it mostly from conservatives of various sorts that I, I would say. And since I'm one of those sorts myself, I can speak from real experience. They talk as if the right interpretation of a difficult Bible passage is utterly obvious and clear, and all their evangelical Christian opponents are dolts or devils for not seeing it. This can happen in the Calvinism-Arminianism debate, for example, on both sides. Or they say things like this, Greek is a perfectly precise language. Now, I hear this sort of thing most frequently from people who are not King James only. They tend to not value the Greek so much. So I'm applying my slippery slope analogy to my own tribe, okay? But Greek is not the most precise language known to man. Greek is preciser than English in specifying the number of second person pronouns, singular or plural, for example, but it's less precise than English in its use of the rather ambiguous and rather frequent genitive construction, X of X, we say in Greek class. I wrote an article on this a few years ago called Greek is not math. It's not an algebraic equation in which you toss in the words, tell the exegetical calculator which grammar algorithms to employ, press enter, and get a perfect interpretation. If you've had even just a little Greek or are just starting out, you've just got to hear my friend Andrew Case's podcast interviews with Nathaniel Erickson on this topic. He's a Southern Seminary PhD, and he quickly and clearly and deftly takes what have been seed thoughts for me and grows them into trees, tracing out quite a number of specific branches. I'll put a link in the show notes to articles that I had Nathaniel write for me on the same topic. They were just stupendous. Nathaniel gives three reasons why pastors say Greek is perfectly precise. One of them is that basically it's the equivalent of a revivalist preacher yelling louder when he knows his point is weak. Appeal to the precision of Greek can be a bit of a fig leaf for nervous interpreters. It can be used in a well-intentioned way to buttress people's faith. Don't worry, folks, we know exactly what God said here in every detail. I believe scripture has all the clarity God gave it and that Jesus has the right to ask us on that day, have you not read? But I've worked on too many difficult and obscure Bible passages just in the New Testament to believe that Greek is math that gives us perfect interpretations. God did not give us warrant to say this. Protestants who stand on an upper portion of the slope but dangle their feet over the perfect inter interpretation step downward, they include too people who think Bible interpretation is easy, who people who never bother getting good commentaries or grammars or dictionaries because they're unnecessary, superfluous. Why listen to what other teachers say about the Bible when my own interpretations are already rock solid or when it doesn't even need to be interpreted, just read in the way that I read it? The fact is though, there is no mechanism with in Protestantism because there is no mechanism given in scripture by which anyone outside your church can be made to heal over a given interpretation. There are church discipline proceedings occasionally then. People have their interpretations of scripture forced in line by proper ecclesiastical authorities, pastors and elders. But all these folks have to do in modern America is move to another church. And more often than not, I would say way more often than not, they do. That's why the next and final logical step is step four, eliminating the possibility of someone moving to another church by saying that there's only one and you have to do what its human authority says or else. That's why step four is what good is a perfect interpretation of the Bible without a perfect person to tell us which interpretation is the perfect one. Those best known for making this move down the slippery slope are, of course, Roman Catholics. Supposedly, the Pope cuts through pervasive interpretive pluralism by interpreting the Bible for the church. To be fair, responsible and knowledgeable Roman Catholics do not believe that popes are perfect persons 
any check of the history books, the church history books, will dispel this notion immediately. But popes, when they speak from their special chair of authority, ex cathedra, it's called, they are considered to speak for God. The pope is called the vicar of Christ on earth. He stands in Christ's stead. The Catholic Catechism says, the task of giving an authentic interpretation of the word of God, whether in its written form or in the form of tradition, has been entrusted to the living teaching office of the church alone. Its authority in this matter is exercised in the name of Jesus Christ. This means that the task of Bible interpretation has been entrusted to the bishops in communion with the successor of Peter, the Bishop of Rome, in other words, the Pope. The Catholic Catechism says the task of interpreting the word of God authentically has been entrusted solely to the magisterium of the church, that is, to the Pope and to the bishops in communion with him. When interpreting scripture officially, the Pope is effectively a perfect person. In some authoritarian Protestant churches, the pastor is a little Pope. His word on scripture is final, or so I've heard. I've definitely heard people say that's the way it was at their church, and I have seen doctrinal statements from King James-only churches, this is the only time I've seen them, which explicitly say, I've seen this actually many times, they say that the pastor is the sole final judge on all doctrinal matters. But I've never attended a church where the pastor acted like a pope. The three senior pastors that I've had in my adult life, anyway, have all been humble men who were servants of the word, not masters of it. They didn't lord it over the people. The Bible does give pastors a measure of authority, of course. 1 Peter 5 tells the younger to submit to the elders. Hebrews 13 tells us to obey those who have the rule over us. Those statements were evaluated in the 1950s by the House Un-American Activities Committee. They just don't sit right with Americans. Have you ever heard of a person submitting to the authoritative guidance of a pastor? I have, but it's not frequent. I think I would say I have done it. But it's definitely countercultural. But by painting pictures of dysfunctional churches and warning against false teachers and giving qualifications for church elders and commanding that elders who sin should be rebuked in front of everyone, scripture limits the authority of pastors. Their authority is derived from that of what Peter calls the chief shepherd. There is a logic I'm describing, a logic of rightward and downward drift Empirically, most responsible King James defenders stop at the first step down the slope, praise God. But they get pulled further downward and to the right. Leftward temptations, in my experience, don't seem to affect them as they do me, I'll be honest. And I warn them, brothers, sin lieth at the door, its desire is for you. And for you, I think, it lies on the right side of the door. Watch and pray that ye slide no further down the rightward slope. I have more to say about the rightward slope, but it's taking me some time to get my thoughts in order. I want to be very careful because I am being very critical. You'll have to wait for one jump cut to another scene. Indeed, I am not done. I want to turn now, and much more briefly, I sure hope for your sake, to a second sobering observation about the rightward slope. King James onlyism is often connected to obscurantism in other areas of life beyond bibliology. I didn't say always, I said often. Often enough that I think this is more than worth mentioning. In a pastor's group I'm in on Facebook, one pastor was looking for help shepherding a family that he had invested in deeply for many years, only to see them leave for a rapidly King James only Ruckmanite church. Another pastor said, I have found that the problem with King James onlyism is not so much that its adherents believe in the King James, but that they are dogmatic about so many things that it's impossible to be dogmatic about. Women's dress, church music, work on Sundays, etc. This testimony is true, and I want to make a specific appeal based on a criticism someone once made of me. As a young man, I was interested in dating a girl whose father feared I was too conservative. This is not my current father-in-law, this is long, long ago. He himself was conservative, he was a Christian, but he wondered if I was susceptible to narrow influences. I thought that was a fair question even then, and a worthy one, and I've always remembered that phrase, there's wisdom in it. I don't want to be that. It seems that some people do just like to have an issue or ten that they can be dogmatic about. And I have seen leading defenders of the King James in both the IFB and the Calvinistic branches. I've seen them lament this. I'm not the only one who says this. King James onlyism is a conspiracy theory. It says that the people who say they're trying to help you by translating God's Hebrew and Greek words 
into English in the modern versions, are actually trying to harm you by tampering with those words. So, in my experience, King James onlyism often but not always goes with the rejection of other good things, especially education. Education is a good thing that can be twisted into a bad thing, no doubt. And on the leftward slippery slope, yes, there can be a too great trust in education. But on the rightward slippery slope, the danger is ignorance and anti-intellectualism. Even Alton Beale of Ambassador Baptist College said this same thing recently. I uh, quoted him in the video that I did. It's on the rightward slippery slope that we get the wild claims of Gail Ripplinger, the frankly silly biblical numerics of Mitch Knupp, and the numerous King James defenders who have come to my YouTube comments to tell me that I'm not saved because I read the ESV. The conspiracy theory elements of King James onlyism, both logically and empirically, cut gifted people off from influences and relationships that would be beneficial for them. I'm not a scholar, I don't think. I really am not. I'm an also-ran in the scholarly world. I'm a popularizer. I feel most at home basically preaching, but with an extra bit of nerdiness thrown in, often, even usually, a linguistically tinged nerdiness. I like, though, to facilitate the work of scholars, so I run a scholarly colloquium every year called the Bible Faculty Summit. I'm the president, but what that mostly means is I handle the details so others can use their gifts. I'm more like a secretary and an event planner. I've been going almost every year for, wow, it's, I guess it's been a decade. About 45 Bible professors attend from various schools. We listen to 17 papers in a row in two days. I love it more every year. And I've occasionally invited some King James Only Bible College professors to attend. Once, many moons ago, one of them came. We didn't and really don't see eye to eye on all matters of the Bible's text and translation, but we have genuine respect and love for one another. I have watched this gifted man show incredible humility, and I watched him do it at the Bible Faculty Summit. After listening to a dozen scholarly papers on the Bible from men who were not King James only, he turned to me and he said, Mark, at my King James only school, I'm used to being the smartest Bible guy in the room but I cannot keep up with these guys here at the summit. That was not a boast. That was a profoundly humble and sincere comment. He wasn't dis deflated or discouraged, not even intimidated. He was energized to learn more and he's doing it. And he was humbled. There are gifted students at his King James only school who don't get to develop their intellectual gifts because they are cut off from really excellent books. They are discouraged from giving too much attention to their studies or indeed for going for a grad degree. They're told that to be a pastor, all you need is four years of mostly practical training. They rarely hear really excellent preaching, expositional preaching, and they're steered away from really excellent expository preachers. They are mired in obscurantism. It's incredibly difficult for educated people and uneducated people to be clothed with humility before one another. It goes against the pull of our prideful flesh on both sides. That absolutely goes both ways. Lord, save me from and forgive me for any disdain I have ever showed toward my brothers in King James Onlyism. But I will not pretend that because I have shown pride at times in my education, their pride in their lack of education is okay. I love them too much not to warn them about the far side of the mountain, the rightward slippery slope. After writing 95% of this long video script, I saw that my friend Joshua Barzon, author of The Forgotten Preface, posted some comments from John R. Rice on King James Onlyism. John R. Rice's thinking way back in whenever it was tracks perfectly with Dr. Bob Bell's argument that I used earlier. And even though I already recorded that segment, I want to go back and add this. This is what Rice said. Where in the Bible does God guarantee that any translator of the Bible, anyone who copies the Bible, anyone who preaches the Bible, or anyone who teaches the Bible will be infallibly correct? There is no such scripture. The doctrine of infallibility of the translation in the King James is not a Bible doctrine. It's a man-made scheme. Rice is obviously right. So what use is it then in having a perfect Bible if we can't have all these other perfect things, perfect teaching and preaching, perfect translation? Why do I still believe strongly in biblical inerrancy? Why indeed do I still use the slippery slope argument to defend inerrancy? Because I accept the Bible's teaching about itself. 
because the Spirit has confirmed its truth to me in multiple ways, because, Lord, to whom shall we go? The Bible alone tells me about the Jesus who gives eternal life, because I've actually sat down and looked at every last difference between the two major Greek New Testament texts that are on offer right now, the Scrivener's Greek New Testament and the critical text, and they're just not that different. They teach precisely the same Christian faith. The differences, after 15 centuries of hand copying, are just minor, minor, minor. I'm not saying that everyone who is King James only will slide down the slippery slope that Dr. Bell saw and that I have described. Praise God again that he is able to make them stand and not slide. I'm saying what my godly and faithful dissertation committee chairman, Dr. Randy Lee, said in an excellent article a few years back, an article that I begged him to write and that I ultimately shot as a video on my YouTube channel, the only time I've had a script written by somebody else. Namely, that perfection is not something God gives us in this age. God in Scripture does not seem all that interested in giving us perfect anything on this side of heaven. We don't have perfect interpreters. We don't have perfect interpretations. We don't have perfect Bible translations. And we don't have perfect texts. And yet, we have the gospel. We have the Spirit. We have the Word and multiple excellent translations of it. Let us be content. I believe then that defenders of the exclusive use of the King James should consider when they use the slippery slope argument, what my mom said to me when I was 10 and I held for the first time a Red Rider BB gun with a compass in the stock and this thing that tells time. She said with her great motherly wisdom, be careful where you point that thing. I was in the very act of saying, mom, I know how to, and the gun went off, bouncing a steel BB all around the concrete floor of the covered porch that we were standing on with my, my friend's mom as well. Point taken, mom. Now take my point. Those who live on slippery slopes should not throw heavy stones that make them shift their weight or they might go tumbling down the slip and slide. Logically, Many evangelicals who accept female pastors, and here I'm speaking especially of those who are willing to simply relativize Paul's statements um, in 1 Corinthians 14, 1 Timothy 2, as merely cultural or situation-specific. Many of these have brought themselves closer to affirming homosexuality. I pray they stand. Logically, those King James onlyists who reject the New King James have brought themselves closer to Ruckmanite double inspiration. I pray they stand. It seems to me that the Lord has indeed made many or even most of these brothers and sisters on both of the sides I've just described. He's made them stand rather than slide. But do beware of the slippery slopes, plural. Ask yourself honestly which one you're on on any given issue, you know, the left word or the right word. When young men do leave King James Onlyism, I tell them to take only one step away from it. The danger of overcorrection of the pendulum swing, to use another analogy, is, is very real. I myself have changed only very slowly and with years of prayer, thought, study, counsel, and conversation. I'd rather die than slide down the slippery slope. I've literally prayed, literally, that the Lord would end my life rather than let me slide left or right. I want to stay faithful to the end and having done all to stand.